so uh, Brian, aren't you glad he's the pastor of this church, by the way? Amen. We are very grateful that the Lord let us do his family. And to you, Brian. Thank you. So um, I'm known as the weeping pastor if you're visiting today. And uh, there's actually a line in Vegas that says how long it's going to take Pastor Kerry to weep during the sermon. And if you bet within the first 30 seconds, you're going to win some money today. So the Bible says in John chapter 1, the word became flesh uh, and dwelt among us. And we have beheld his glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father. And uh, so Brian talked about the Word of God. I want to talk about God, the Word, and that is the person of Jesus Christ. And this morning I want to read two verses from chapter 3 of the Gospel of John. And the first is probably the best known verse in all of Scripture. It's John 3.16. I'm sure many of you have this memorized. Uh, according to World Vision, a Christian organization, uh, which tracks internet searches for passages found in the Bible. Uh, in 2022, this was the most searched for verse of all the 31,102 verses contained in the Protestant Old and New Testaments. But the second one uh, might be equally important, and I'm actually sure it is, and here's why. Because no one goes to heaven without it. It's John 3.17. Here's what it says to you. Let me read both. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. John 3, 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Now, both of these verses are really important when it comes to the topic of salvation because they provide the reason why anyone goes to heaven. Uh, outside of the truth that's contained in these verses, uh, we have no hope. Uh, there is no hope. We are doomed to an eternity separated from God in hell. And so with that in mind, I, I just want to consider what each verse talks about for just a few moments and the, the purpose of Christ's coming. And, and I would say that they contain good news, better news, and the best news. Are you ready? Let's talk about the good news. Here it is. God loves you. That's good news. God loves you. In fact, God loves everyone. He does. Uh, a good definition of love, at least I think it is, is self-sacrifice that achieves the highest good for another. Now, in these verses, the Bible says that God's love is seen in what Christ accomplished for us, what he did for us, but also in what he did not do to us. And so let's talk about it, what he did. In obedience to his Father's will, Jesus came into the world as a fully human person. He was born in a manger at Bethlehem, and he had to come into the world and as a human representative, live a life of perfect obedience to his Father, so that ultimately Jesus, as a human being, could sacrifice himself for all human beings by shedding his blood on the cross of Calvary. The uh, Bible says he came into the world the same way that all of us do. He was born of a mother. Now, admittedly, he, he had no earthly father. The scripture says that, uh, that um, the most power of the Most High overshadowed Mary so that she was able to give birth to the Son of God. And because he was God's son, Jesus was able to do everything in keeping with his father's will. As a matter of fact, one time he looked at a crowd, and in the crowd were some of the people he, that would have considered themselves enemies of Jesus and probably his disciples. And he looked at them and he said, which of you can convict me of anything I've done wrong? And they couldn't. No one could say a thing. And the Bible says that the sinless Lamb of God, at the right time, uh, at the perfect moment in all of human history, he offered himself on the cross as our substitute. He took upon himself the just punishment for sin that all of us deserve. And the last part of John 3.16 tells us that when we believe in Jesus, when we put our faith and trust in him, we, we know, the scripture says, that we will not perish but have eternal life. Uh, 1 John 5.13 says it like this. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. That's the gospel message. That's the good news. That's what Jesus did for us. But it also says in John 3.17 what he did not do. 
And that is this, that instead of coming to condemn us in our sin, the Bible says that Jesus did not come to condemn us. He did not come, uh, even though we deserve condemnation from God, the Bible says the wages of sin is death and the free gift of God is eternal life. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Listen to how the same thing of describing people as sinners is spoken of in Scripture. It says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. It says, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in even one part of it has become guilty of all of it. Uh, it says the human beings call evil good and good evil. We put darkness for light and light for darkness. We plan inequity and we plot out evil on our beds. And if you don't think these verses apply to all of us, guess again. When John 3.17 says that Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, it doesn't mean that we weren't worthy of being condemned. Truth is, we were. I mean, the great myth that men want to, to live by and believe is that human beings are basically good. But the Bible says otherwise. Jeremiah 17.9 says it this way, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately sick, and who can understand it? Contrary to what we want to believe, that we are victims rather than villains, and deprived rather than depraved, the Bible is not very flattering when it comes to the very character of human beings, in describing the darkness of the human soul. Chuck Colson told the story of a Holocaust survivor. His name was Yehiel Denier. He gave testimony during the trial of Adolf Eichmann, the architect of the Nazi final solution from World War II. Uh, this evil man, if you've heard of Eichmann, uh, actually presided over the slaughter of millions of Jews. And as Denier testified in court to the crimes of Eichmann, he suddenly broke out into uncontrollable sobs. He collapsed on the floor. When asked later to explain what happened, he said, I was afraid about myself. I saw that I am capable to do this exactly like he. The reporter who interviewed Denner concluded that the most chilling fact about Adolf Eichmann was that he was normal. Eichmann, he said, is in all of us. And the Bible agrees. Sin in all of its ugliness has affected every human heart. There is no difference between any of us when it comes to sin. Listen to what it says in John 3.18. Whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. So Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world because we stand condemned before God right now. And so the good news is that Christ did something for us. He offered himself as a sacrifice for our sin. He did not come to condemn us. Here's the better news. It's the second part of John 3, 17. It says this, that the world might be saved through him. Luke 19, 10 tells us that the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So what's Jesus like? He's like a woman who lost a coin and spent all day trying to find it, and when she did, she rejoiced. It's like a shepherd who lost one sheep and he left all the others behind him, and he went out and he searched for that sheep until he found it and brought it back to the fold. He's like a father who welcomed home his, his prodigal son. Jesus came seeking those who were caught in the act of adultery. He came seeking blind beggars, lepers, and wild demon-possessed men. He even came seeking self-righteous Pharisees who didn't even think that they needed a Savior. He came seeking fishermen. Physicians, tax collectors, pastors. He came seeking one who was hanging on a cross beside him, who was dying for his crimes. What does it say? That even the worst of us can be saved. That's what it says. Corey Tenboom liked to say it this way There is no pit that is so deep that the love of God is not deeper still. God has more grace in his heart to give than we have sin in our lives. 
Someone else has said, Jesus is a better savior than we are sinners. For some, that's hard to believe. We, we shudder to think that someday God will play back the unedited version of our lives. But I want you to know today that the glory of God and the gospel is no matter how bad your life has been, Christ came to save you. That's better news. But here's the best news. You can be saved right now by repenting of your sin and turning in faith to Jesus Christ. This kind of faith is limited to just some sort of intellectual exercise of recognizing the truth of the scriptures. It's more than that, it's personal. The Bible speaks uh, in John 3, 17 of, of the wor world. It uses the word three times. It says Christ did not come to condemn the world. He came into the world, but he didn't come to condemn the world. And uh, it also says that he came that the world might be saved through him. And this includes every one of us. So maybe the entrance, the sign over the entrance to the kingdom of heaven would say something like this. Only forgiven sinners welcome. So if you're a sinner uh, who needs to be forgiven, you can receive that forgiveness today and you'll be welcome. The second thing is salvation only comes through Jesus. The scripture says, there's no other name under heaven by which a person can be saved. Jesus said it himself. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. These verses are not very popular, as you can imagine, with people who think Christianity is so narrow-minded. The message would be more widely accepted if Jesus would have said, I am a way, a truth, and a life, and, and there are many ways to the Father, and you can seek any of them. But he didn't say that. Uh, the words of our Lord are an invitation, and they're also a warning. That God wants everyone to be saved, but there is a condition that has to be met for this to happen. We have to truly believe in Jesus Christ. That his sacrifice on the cross paid the full penalty of our sin, and through faith in him we can have life. Have you ever done that? Have you ever put your faith in Jesus Christ? Have you ever said, I'm done, like Brian, I, I'm done. I, I've, I've now, I've, I've pursued everything else, but I've found the truth, and I know it's in you, Jesus. And today I want to put my trust in you. You can do that today. You can do that right now. It would be as simple as saying, I open up the door to my life, Lord, and I receive you in. And I ask for you to forgive my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness and make me the person you want me to be. Be my Savior and be my Master. Let's bow our heads for a moment. If, if the Lord's been speaking to you today through Pastor Brian or through the gospel message in John 3, 6, 16 and 17, then, then I'd encourage you, don't put it off. Say that to Jesus right now. Say, Lord Jesus, I confess that I am a sinner. Uh, I am the lost person. But right now I choose to turn from my sin and I choose to turn to you and I ask you to be my Savior and Lord. And I invite you to come into my heart and forgive my sin and to make me into the person that you want me to be. So I put my faith and trust in you today. If you prayed that prayer with me just now, I'd encourage you to tell someone today. You tell me, tell Pastor Brian, tell Pastor Rick, uh, any of us, but tell someone that you put your faith and trust in Jesus. The story is told in the Old West of a young man. He was about 15 years old and he shot and killed someone in a fit of anger. And the judge who had jurisdiction over that area uh, heard the trial and sentenced the young man to die. Uh, but because he was so young, some of the townspeople came to the judge and appealed to him for mercy. And he consented, but only on the condition that the pardon would be delivered by the local preacher in the pages of a Bible. A few days before he was to be hung, the young man noticed the preacher coming to his cell. But before the man of God could hand over the Bible with the pardon in it, the young fellow made it clear in no uncertain terms that he didn't want to hear a single thing that the pastor had to share. The pastor pleaded with them to listen, but he, he wouldn't. And so the pastor turned, away, turned around and left. Uh, afterward, the guard explained that the preacher had come to offer a pardon, but sadly he had rejected it. 
Two days later, as he stood on the gallows, the young man asked to speak to the crowd who mourned his fate. He said, I am dying today, not because I killed a man, but because I rejected the pardon. The gospel message is a good message. It's a great message. It's the best possible news. It says that you are offered a pardon for all your sins in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ if you will but put your faith and trust in him.